Ranger's Apprentice, Book 4, The Oakleaf Bearers, by John Flanagan. Chapter 1. It was a constant tapping sound that roused Will from his deep, untroubled sleep. He had no idea at what point he first became aware of it. It seemed to slide unobtrusively into his sleeping mind, magnified and amplified inside his subconscious, until it crossed over into the conscious world and he realised he was awake and wondering what it might be. Tap, tap, tap. It was still there, but not so loud now that he was awake and aware of other sounds in the small cabin. From the corner, behind a small curtain of sacking that gave her a modicum of privacy, he could hear Evelyn's even breathing. Obviously, the tapping hadn't woken her. There was a muted crackle from the heaped coals in the fireplace at the end of the room, and, as he became more fully awake, he heard them settle with a slight rustling sound. Tap. It seemed to come from close to him. He stretched and yawned, sitting up on the rough couch he'd fashioned from wood and canvas. He shook his head to clear it, and, for a moment, the sound was obscured. Then it was back once more, and he realised it was coming from outside the window. The oiled cloth panes were translucent. They would admit the grey light of the pre-dawn, but he couldn't see anything more than a blur through them. He knelt on the couch and unlatched the frame, pushing it up and craning his head through the opening to study the small porch of the cabin. A gust of chill air entered the room and he heard Evelyn stir as it eddied around, causing the sacking curtain to billow inwards and the embers in the fireplace to glow more fiercely until a small tongue of yellow flame was released from them. Somewhere in the trees... A bird was greeting the first light of a new day, and the tapping sound was obscured once more. Then he had it. It was water, dripping from the end of a long icicle that depended from the porch roof and falling onto an upturned bucket that had been left on the edge of the porch. Tap, 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 tap. Will frowned to himself. There was something significant in this, he knew, but his mind, still fuddled with sleep, couldn't quite grasp what it was. He stood, still stretching, and shivered slightly as he left the last warmth of his blanket and made his way to the door. Hoping not to wake Evelyn, he eased the latch upwards and slowly opened the door, holding it up so that the sagging leather hinges wouldn't allow the bottom edge to scrape the floor of the cabin. Closing the door behind him, he stepped out onto the rough boards of the porch, feeling them strike icy cold against his bare feet. He moved to the spot where the water dripped endlessly onto the bucket, realising as he went that other icicles hanging from the roof were dripping water also. He hadn't seen this before. He was sure they didn't usually do this. He glanced out at the trees, where the first rays of the sun were beginning to filter through. In the forest, there was a slithering thump as a load of snow finally slid clear of the pine branches that had supported it for months and fell in a heap to the ground below. It was then that he realised the significance of the endless tap-tap-tap that had woken him. Behind him, he heard the door creak and he turned to see Evelyn, her hair wildly tousled, her blanket wrapped tight around her against the cold. "'What is it?' she asked him. "'Is something wrong?' He hesitated a second, glancing at the growing puddle of water beside the bucket. "'It's the thaw,' he said finally. After their meagre breakfast, they sat in the early morning sun as it streamed across the porch." Neither of them had wanted to discuss the significance of Will's earlier discovery, although they had since found more signs of the thaw. There were small patches of soaked brown grass showing through the snow cover on the ground surrounding the cabin 
and the sound of wet snow sliding from the trees to hit the ground was becoming increasingly common. The snow was still thick on the ground and in the trees, of course, but the signs were there that the thaw had begun, and that, inexorably, it would continue. I suppose we'll have to think about moving on, Will said finally, voicing the thought that had been in both their minds. You're not strong enough yet, Evelyn told him. It had barely been three weeks since he had thrown off the mind-numbing effects of the warm weed given to him as a yard slave in Ragnak's lodge. Will had been weakened by inadequate food and clothing and a regimen of punishing physical work before they had made their escape. Since then, their meagre diet in the cabin had been enough to sustain life, but not to restore his strength or endurance. They had lived on the cornmeal and flour that had been stored in the cabin, along with a small stock of vegetables and the stringy meat from whatever game Evelyn and he had been able to snare. There was little enough of that in winter, and what game they had managed to catch had been in poor condition itself, providing little in the way of nourishment. Will shrugged. I'll manage, he said simply. I'll have to. And that, of course, was the heart of the problem. They both knew that once the snow in the high passes had melted, hunters would again begin to visit the high country where they found themselves. Already, Evelyn had seen one such, the mysterious rider in the forest on the day when Will's senses had returned to him. Fortunately, since that day, there had been no further sign of him. But it was a warning. Others would come, and, before they did, Will and Evelyn would have to be long gone, heading down the far side of the mountain passes and across the border into Tutland. Evelyn shook her head doubtfully. For a moment she said nothing. Then she realised that Will was right. Once the thaw was well and truly underway, they would have to leave whether she felt he was strong enough to travel or not. Anyway, she said at length, we have a few weeks yet. The thaw's only just started, and who knows, we may even get another cold snap. It was possible, she thought. Perhaps not probable, but at least it was possible. Will nodded agreement. There's always that, he said. The silence fell over them once more like a blanket. Abruptly, Evelyn stood, dusting off her breeches. I'll go and check the snares, she said, and when Will began to rise to accompany her, she stopped him. You stay here, she said gently. From now on, you're going to have to conserve your strength as much as possible. Will hesitated, then nodded. He recognised that she was right. She collected the hessian sack they used as a game bag and slung it over her shoulder. Then, with a small smile in his direction, the girl headed off into the trees. Feeling useless and dispirited, Will slowly began to gather up the wooden platters they had used for their meal. All he was good for, he thought bitterly, was washing up. The snare line had moved further and further from the cabin over the past three weeks. As small animals, rabbits and squirrels, and the occasional snow hare had fallen prey to the snares that Will had built, so the other animals in that area had become more wary. As a consequence, they had been compelled to move the snares into new locations every few days, each one a little further away from the cabin than the one before. Evelyn estimated that she had a good 40 minutes walking on the narrow uphill track before she would reach the first snare. Of course, if she'd been able to move straight to it, the walk would have been considerably shorter. But the track wound and wandered through the trees, more than doubling the distance she had to cover. The signs of the thaw were all around her, now that she was aware of it. The snow no longer squeaked dryly underfoot as she walked. It was heavier, wetter, and her steps sank deeply into it. The leather of her new boots was already soaked from contact with the melting snow. The last time she had walked this way, she reflected, the snow had simply coated her boots as a fine, dry powder. 
she also began to notice more activity among the wildlife in the area. Birds flitted through the trees in greater numbers than she'd previously seen, and she startled a rabbit on the track, sending it scurrying back into the protection of a snow-covered thicket of blackberries. At least, she thought, all this extra activity might increase the chances of finding some worthwhile game in the snares. She saw the discreet sign that Will had cut into the bark of a pine and turned off the track to find the spot where she and Will had laid the first of the snares. She recalled how gratefully she had greeted his recovery from the wormweed drug. Her own survival skills were negligible, and Will had provided welcome expertise in devising and setting snares to supplement their diet. It was all part of his training under Holt, he had told her. She remembered now how, when he had mentioned the older ranger's name, his eyes had misted for a few moments and his voice had choked slightly. Not for the first time, the two young people felt very, very far from home. As she pushed her way through the snow-laden bushes, becoming wetter and wetter in the process, she felt a surge of pleasure. The first snare in the line held the body of a small ground-foraging bird. They had caught a few of these previously, and she knew the bird's flesh made excellent eating. About the size of a small chicken, it had carelessly poked its neck through the wire noose of the snare, then become entangled. Evelyn smiled grimly as she thought how once she might have objected to the cruelty of the bird's death. Now all she felt was a sense of satisfaction as she realised that they would eat well today. Amazing how an empty belly could change a perspective, she thought, removing the noose from the bird's neck and stuffing the small carcass in her makeshift game bag. She reset the snare, sprinkling a few seeds of corn on the ground beyond it, then rose to her feet frowning in annoyance as she realised that the melting snow had left two wet patches on her knees as she'd crouched. She sensed, rather than heard, the movement in the trees behind her and began to turn. Before she could move, she felt an iron grip around her throat and, as she gasped in fright, a fur-gloved hand, smelling vilely of smoke, sweat and dirt, clapped over her mouth and nose, cutting off her cry for help.